Bridget Ayer here uh, with All About the Grace. I am is Sandra Measles. She is um, an author, a speaker, and uh, basically a, a church historian as well. She has a copy there she's going to hold yes. up. Yeah. Yes, and that book, um, there's, it's very relevant because there's a new HBO series out called His Dark Materials, and that's really our topic today. We're going to be talking about pop culture and this particular new series that this book really addresses the um, book series that the HBO series is based on. So um, maybe give us a little bit of your background, got into writing, and how you ended up writing The Da Vinci Hoax. Well, I have been writing professionally since the mid-1970s, first in science fiction, and then because of knowledge I had gained in science fiction about neo-paganism, I got to write for the National Catholic Register starting in 1984, and I was a contributing editor there before the Legionaries came in the picture. Okay. And I also wrote for other, you know, a lot of other Catholic publications. Nowadays, I principally appear on Catholic World Report website, okay. mm -hmm. and you can find links to anything that I do by simply googling my name, and all sorts of um, articles that are online will come up. I want to talk about this new HBO series. It just came out. I think the first of November is when it dropped. Yes. Um, it's a BBC in cooperation with HBO series, from, from what I understand, and it's based on Philip Pullman's books, uh, book series, which is, I guess, kind of it's being... Trilogy. Trilogy, okay. So, what's, what are the books about? What are the books' names, and what, what are the books about? Well, to basically. To quote the author, my books are about killing God. That is the overall quest which is accomplished by the heroine of Philip Pullman's Dark Materials. The trilogy, which consists of Golden Compass as the title in the U.S., The Subtle Knife, and The Amber Spyglass, and they're okay. all under the title His Dark Materials. And then he's published other books in the same universe and a guide, uh, Lyra's Oxford, and so forth and so forth. But these books have been highly honored in the, the literature field. And Pullman was knighted this year for his services mm -hmm. to literature. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been given the Carnegie Award and the White Bread Prize, competing with adult books, by the way, and voted by Newsweek magazine one of the 100 greatest books of all time. Right up there with Jane Austen and Tolstoy and all the rest of them. That's ridiculous. So anyway, now, I, I get off on my I get emotional when I talk oh, about these things. Okay. So you and I know in, in previous conversations you've mentioned to me that you don't really have take issue with his particular writing craft, though you, you don't mm -hmm. think he's maybe as, as good as all these people have said. Yes. But yes. the issue that you take with is the anti-Catholic, anti-Christian, anti-religious establishment yes. event that his books are about. Very that much so. Uh, Pullman is a really good writer. His, uh, his prose is beautiful. His imagination is wide-ranging. But this talent is put to an evil purpose in these books. And the odd thing is, it doesn't look that bad when you pick up a copy of The Golden Compass. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on the book jacket copy that would raise a question in the book buyer's mind. Uh, should I give this to my child or should I read it myself? It looks like a nice high-end children's fantasy. Uh, what is described is a little girl in an Oxford in an alternate universe uh, go, has many adventures trying to rescue her kidnapped friend. Well, yes, she does. She kid, she rescues her kidnapped friend. That's not all that goes on. Mm -hmm. When this alternate universe is one in which the church, through its political arm, the magisterium, controls most of the human race in a very cruel and repressive manner, 
there's an inquisition, uh, people will be tortured and killed for being heretics, and it, it extends itself into every part of life. And Pullman can uh, very piously say, oh, I didn't mean the Catholic Church, but it has all the Catholic trappings with bishops and priests and nuns and Catholic symbols and angels, da-da-da-da. And, well, and terminology, and terminology, even the word magisterium, um, you know, is a very... Very ca specifically word. Catholic word, yes. Anybody that knows what the magisterium is, which is the leadership of the church, um, yes. is going to draw that analogy. And then for those who maybe don't know what that is, when they, and when they hear that term magisterium, if they hear that term in Catholic circles, they're already going to have a very negative view and a very formed de definition of what that means based on this book or based yes. on the series. Yes. Now, of course, in the real world, magisterium is the teaching office of the Catholic Church. Okay. All right. Which okay. is, you know, <laughs> we're not out to rule the world, folks. But in Philip Pullman's universe, you, which is a very peculiar sort of Edwardian in its, its habits, it's what in science fiction is called steampunk, okay. where you have you have um, an alternate technology. People are using zeppelins to get around, and the electric lights are called anbaric lights. But what is most significant, aside from the fact that it's a theocracy, is that every person in this universe has his own personal demon, which is a visual representation of his soul. The demon takes the form of an animal. Uh, it's changeable when uh, you're young. And then after puberty, it is set in a definite pattern. Uh, for instance, Lyra's uh, demon eventually is a pine marten, and somebody else might have a cat or a monkey or a bird, whatever. But that expresses some aspect of their personality. And people would see the word demon and say, oh, 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 it's, it's, it's that's not what's demonic about the books. The mm -hmm. demons are no more demonic than Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio. They act as a conscience with a person, and they interact with the person mentally, uh, so they can have a debate with themselves, and you can reveal their thoughts this way. Anyway, Lyra is an orphan who is the ward of a mythic of an invented college at Oxford. Okay. And she's a wild child. She lies constantly. She runs around and does nasty pranks. And the gentleman scholars don't know what to do with her. She is given an object called the gold, which they call the golden compass, an mm -hmm. eletheriometer, which is a truth measuring device. It looks like a pocket watch with symbols on it. And when Lyra figures out how to use it, she can use this really as a divinity, as a fortune telling device. That okay. the messages that she gets through the golden compass are actually coming from rebel angels, what we would call devils, but because the book is written with the reversed polarity, the rebel angels are the good guys and the heavenly angels are the bad guys. Well, it's really interesting. When I was doing research for, we did an uh, interview on Catholic Radio Indy, which I'll put the link to that podcast um, on this show. Uh, but isn't there that scripture where it talks about, um, like in the end times, people will put, make evil good and good evil? And I, yes. I hear a lot in our culture, and I, that's the thing that came to mind when I was reading this, that people get so confused. And it seems like there's enough, truth like when you talk about inquisition and you use terms like magisterium there's enough truth in it that pe people that don't know their history um, will be taught or formed by this movie rather than the truth yes yes so you're going to be uh, you're going to be progressively drawn into an atheist viewpoint. And Pullman's very upfront. I'm an atheist, although he considers himself a Church of England atheist, and he likes the King James Bible. How nice. 
<laughs> but uh, Lyra is using this device is set off on a mission to rescue children that are being kidnapped off the streets of Oxford, including her favorite playmate, Roger. And in this, the course of this, she herself is being chased by the Magisterium, which wants to capture her. This, obviously, this series was geared towards children, the mm -hmm. book. Yes. And it's, it's kind of a way, basically, Philip Pullman is an atheist, and he really is trying to indoctrinate people yes. into yes. that way of thinking and by and and by kind of vilifying the Catholic Church or anyone that's religious or uh, institutional religion. Institutional religion, i.e., for example, the Catholic Church is the bad guy in his in Philip Coleman's worldview. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. He's against all forms of organized religion because he equates them with repression, cruelty, and killing. He says this, and organized religion is against sex. Very big item in this book because of the way the demons are related to the child going through puberty. What is going on is the church, an, an agency allied to the church, is can't uh, kidnapping these children and taking them away to cut the tie between the child and his demon to prevent the emergence of original sin. In the theology of the magisterium, original sin is not an inherited fault, it's an acquired fault that you get when you go through puberty because, oh my, you might have sexual relations. So, and so the the Philip Pullman's books are really, um, or the trilogy, is kind of an inversion of Paradise Lost. Yes, yes, he was greatly influenced by Paradise Lost. And he says that the title comes from a line from Paradise Lost, and also influenced by the English poet William Blake. And William Blake, in critiquing Paradise Lost, said that uh, John Milton was of the devil's party but didn't know it. Whereas Pullman says, I am of the devil's party and I do know it. He thinks this is a lot of fun. Oh, what goes on is by the end of the Golden of the Golden Compass, the first volume that is being dramatized on HBO, Lyra will rescue her friend Roger. And then Roger is killed by her father to generate energy to open a path from what, this universe to others. The movie, the uh, unsuccessful movie that came out in 2007, stopped before Roger is killed, leaving you with the idea that it's a happy ending. No, it's not. Little Roger is sacrificed to the greater good of Lyra's father uh, finding a way to communicate between worlds because he intends to lead a rebellion against God the authority, as it is called. And as the story goes on, uh, Lyric also walks into the other universe, meets a boy from our universe called Will, who uh, goes with her on her adventures, and ultimately they find where the authority God is hiding and open up his dwelling place and cause him to die. Not deliberately, but they're, they're thinking that they're helping him get out of this container. And once he hits the air, he draws. So, so God dies in the... God dies, and God wasn't really God in the first place. God was just an angel who convinced the other angels that he was the creator. He was the, the eldest angel, and he ages over the millennia. Uh, which Philip insists that the God of the Bible does too, but that's, of course, ridiculous. God is outside of time. And Pullman says, isn't it nice we've killed God through an act of charity, not an act of violence? And Lyra and Will, who are about 12 years old when this starts, by the end, they are hitting puberty, and there is a very ambiguous uh, climax where they are kissing in a little hut 
and then there's a fade out. Well, Pullman coyly says, I didn't say that the children fornicate. Oh, no, all I said was they kiss. But you are led to believe that that is what has happened. And because of their sin, the world is a better place. The universes are all saved. And we will now have the Republic of Heaven instead of the Kingdom of Heaven with no God and no dictatorial good angels. So then, so the second two books, there is no God? Is that kind of where we're at? So well, we don't discover that until the end of the third one. Okay. So the victory for Pullman is to get rid of God. Yes. To yes. And to free, to free all the sentient beings of all the universes from this false authority figure. Uh, and it's it's a it's a complex universe, but the main elements are that religions that believe in a specific form of life, who mm -hmm. believe in one God, are evil. All forms of religion are evil and repressive, and we're going to liberate ourselves from these terrible strictures, which might get in the way of our sex life. Oh yes, there's also a nun who's a who is trained in nuclear physics who leaves the convent to indulge in a love affair and she becomes the temptress to arrange that will and lyra will wind up in that little hut kissing wow <laughs> yeah, i'm deliberately making spoilers for those people who uh might watch the the dramatization on hbo the second but the season first, has already been ordered, and that I presume will be the next book, The Subtle Knife. Uh, in England, this thing was greeted with rapturous reviews this past week. In America, the reviews were a little more measured because they said the opening episodes are kind of slow and a little boring because they have so much information to impart. But it's lavishly produced. We have excellent actors in the roles. The movie was lavishly produced. It had excellent actors in the roles. Uh, definitely, uh, I think it was better cast than the TV show is. For instance, the cowboy with the hot air balloon in the movie was played by Sam Elliott, that gorgeous man. And in the TV show is played by Lin-Manuel Miranda of Hamilton fame. When you when you talk about the movie, you're talking about the Golden Compass movie. Yes, the Golden the Compass flop. movie from 2007. Which was a flop. Which flopped horribly. It, was, um, it starred uh, Daniel Craig and Nicole Kidman, very first-rate stars. We had oh, people like, um, I'm, I'm blocking on names, and this is ridiculous. Anyway, it, it was it was very lavishly produced, mm -hmm. and they expected it to be a big hit, and they were going to make the other two movies, and then the audience was indifferent. And the problem with the movie was said to be the script is too hard to understand, and we can't follow what's going on. The TV show is advertised as being more faithful to the books, which means they're going to kill Roger at the end of the eighth episode. Poor little Roger. First of all, I think you deserve this. I want you to I want you to talk about what are some concerns for parents um, mm -hmm. or young people in watching popular culture movies, especially if they are if the creators or the books in this situation which the this series is based on are very anti-catholic what are some of the concerns that um you have as both a historian and as an author um that you may have mentioned in the book that you wrote well there's a great deal of moral relativism running through the whole thing when we first well, see lyra explain what moral relativism is Okay, moral relativism says that actions are determined by the desired result. The end justifies the means. Okay. And in this case, um, various things are done, including murder and adultery and subversion, in order to achieve the grand objective of killing God. 
you have uh, Lyra, when we first meet her, is famous for lying. And she doesn't stop lying until way down in the later books. When we see uh, Pullman's idea of heaven, there is no heaven. When you die, you go to this horrible land of shadow, like Sheol in the Old Testament. And everybody is alike, the good and the evil. There's no distinction. She meets um, a monk who doesn't believe he's in hell. She meets a, a virgin martyr from early Christian times who resents the fact that she gave up her life for a lie. And the souls in hell are tormented by harpies, who are a character from Greek mythology. And Lyra and her friend will open up the other world and let the souls flood out into the light, like Christ harrowing hell. Except that once they get out into the light, they pop like blissful champagne bubbles and simply dissolve back into the cosmos. And that's your highest goal, is to dissolve back into the cosmos. There is no personal survival after death. And, and that fits right into New Age spirituality of, you know, we're one with the cosmos and mm -hmm. energy and all these kind of crazy notions that, that kind of negate a personal Lord Jesus, which, you know, we yes. as Catholics... You know, we have a relationship with our God and all that. And, and I, There's an awful lot of nastiness in this um, torture and murder, uh, cannibalism, uh, adultery, homosexual, well, there are homosexual angels whose bodies would be too delicate to actually fornicate together, but they have some kind of spiritual bond and there's an uh, an agent of the inquisition sent after lyra to kill her who is killed by these homosexual angels and then his body is eaten by a lizard so obviously there are a lot of things in here that would not be suitable for young people no. yet um, not, so not really what should people take away, or what would you like people to take away from this interview based on the research that you've done, based on the critique of the books that you've done, mm -hmm. as it relates to this um, new HBO series? And, and hopefully, you know, we, I'll, I'll ask you a pop culture question after this. I won't, I won't stack them up too much. Oh, but okay. What, what do you want people to take away from this interview uh, uh, in terms of what to know about? Well, don't buy a book for yourself or your children or go to a movie with or without your children without knowing what it's about. Be, be prepared to read reviews. Find yourself a media critic whose taste agrees with your own and follow him. Uh, I happen to like the work of Stephen Gradanis, who has a, a movie site called Decent Films. And he also works on another one, Real Faith. He's a deacon in the Catholic Church, and he writes for the National Catholic Register. He's a good source. Oh, yeah, he would be a great source. Yes, he is. He's very, he's very sensible. But know what you're getting into. People who would take their kids to a movie that they haven't looked at what it's about, that's that's really foolish. And I speak as somebody who was taking some highly unsuitable movies as a child. I don't know what my elders were thinking, but uh, I have seen a great many movies in my life. <laughs> and I like movies. I, I try to be quite selective in what I watch. So there is so many resources on the Internet and in publications to acquaint yourself with what you're putting into your mind. And when you read a review on Amazon, because everybody's going to look at Amazon. Sure. Un understand that Amazon reviews can be manipulated. Uh, false reviews can be planted, or the author can beat the bushes and have his family and friends write glowing interviews, uh, reviews. When you read particularly Amazon reviews, notice what they praise about the product. 
and what they don't like about the product. If uh, they praise the product for being a daring attack on conventional morality, well, you perhaps wouldn't like to indulge in that product. If they say, oh, it's too Christian, maybe you would like to indulge in that product. And also educate yourself about how media works. Um, I, as I said, I'm a film buff and my son is a film buff and we talk about movies and TV constantly. You, you have to develop a consciousness of how you are being led into the story in a movie. And Martin Scorsese who has done brilliant things on teaching what film is about. The way the camera follows the character, the way that you cut away, uh, do you have uh, tight shots of his eyes so you can see his inner motivations. You know, the Clint Eastwood films kind of ran that into the ground. But uh, you need to know how, how media works. And this applies also to documentaries or news shows. How are they photographing the protagonist or the person they're interviewing? Are they trying to make him look attractive or unattractive? Uh, 60 Minutes, which we stopped watching in, I think, the, the 70s or 80s, used to be very, very canny about doing that. They could make a proponent of assisted suicide look like a sweet, gentle, soft person, and an opponent of assisted suicide is hard and rigid, and that, of course, was not really the case. Right. Uh, so what we're talking about is is allowing and basically manipulating your audience to believe yes. a certain way, either based on the cinematography or the direct, uh, you know, conversations or whatever. That all these yes. media sources have a bias. They have a um, agenda, for lack of a better word, and they are leading people down. Maybe not so much a rosy path to really bad stuff. The media are the markers and to a much degree the creators of our culture. So please be media wise and media savvy. And there is nothing that can't be depicted in, in a work of art. But how is it depicted? Uh, is it is good presented as evil? Is evil presented as good? A uh, good example, since I am a fan of Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. his movie about gangsters, Goodfellas, an awful lot of horrible things happen in that, murders and uh, adultery and so forth. But the impression that you get is being a gangster is not a glamorous thing. It is stupid, violent, and it destroys everything in its path. So Scorsese is using a very his residual Catholic sensibility to show a story of temptation and fall in the life of the protagonist. You come away from that movie not wishing to imitate the protagonist, I assure you. So you, you and I are both, you know, consumers of, of pop culture and media, but we're not down on pop culture and media. We're like, just be aware of what it's saying. And if it's saying yes. something really negative or, or really uh, detrimental to your, you know, Catholic faith or, you know, I guess your, I guess for us to be your Catholic faith, you know, just be aware of that and don't consume. Yes. yes. I mean, I like, I like the Marvel movies for heaven's sakes. I don't oh, know that I'm going to continue watching them, but I really enjoyed Endgame. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm enough of a nerd. I, I used to read science fiction. I used to write critical material on science fiction. I used to write science fiction. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm into, uh, I'm certainly into pop culture, but I do try to be discriminating. I'm not going to see The Joker. I'm not going to see uh, Suicide Squad or any of that kind of thing. But the general arc of the first cycle of Marvel movies was positive. Mm -hmm. Some of the characters did bad things, but at the end, they're all trying to do the right thing. And they make sacrifices for the good and life triumphs.
So and when you have these pop culture movies that are really aimed towards young people, but all people, I guess, mm -hmm. you gotta have a. There's always a a moral to the story, but if the moral to the story is, you know, really contrary to what's really good for human beings. Um, yes. Then that's where, you know, of course, you know, you and I would agree that's it's for the birds, you know. <laughs> well, listen, you've been really uh, a great guest to have. I, we'll, we'll have to have you on again, and we'll, there's sure. going to be plenty for us to talk about. You've got a wealth of knowledge. So um, Sandra Measle, uh, author of, well, well, two books, The Da Vinci Hoax and the... Well, anyway, and uh, Pied Piper of Atheism. I... I also wrote some science fiction. I mean, if you if you Google my name on Amazon, you will see these other things come up. I also co-edited a serious academic book on Tolkien called Light Beyond All Shadow and have an essay in there. Um, I had a, a academic publications I've written for science fiction reference books and so forth and so forth. Uh, but I've written maybe 400 articles for the Catholic Press in different media. Wow. So all you got to do is, is Google your name, Sandra Measle. Google my name and see what comes up. You will even see some attacks on me. <laughs> I was the subject of a three-part attack in The Remnant. Wow. Well, yeah. Oh, get, that's a badge of honor. If you get attacked, I, I figure you're doing something right. So, you know. Yes. Yes. Uh, right. I, I'd like to think that, but who knows? God knows. Well, we'll have you on again, but thanks so much for uh, being with us today. Okay, thank you very much for having me. God bless.